Hello and welcome. Um, lovely to see you here today. Thanks for coming. Um, some of you I know, some of you I don't. So for those of you I don't, my name's Lucy Campbell. Um, I work in London at Single Homeless Project. Um, and I've been leading on the women's census work for the last couple of years alongside Ellie, who I'll pass over to now to introduce herself. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ellie. Um, I've met quite a few of you already and spoken to a few by email, so it's great to have you all here, thank you. Um, I've been working on the Women's Receiving Census for a couple of years alongside Lucy. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to um, expand and, and work more on the national side of things as well. Um, we've got quite a few people in the meeting, so we probably can't wrap, go around and do introductions, but please do um, introduce yourself in the chat and tell us your, your name and what area you're coming from today, that'd be really helpful. Nice to see you all. Brilliant. Thanks, Ellie. So yeah, do pop your name in the chat so we can see who's in the room. And we do have quite a few more people signed up, so people may join us as we get started as well. So what are we going to cover um, in the next hour and a half together? Um, really, this is a session um, primarily for areas that haven't taken part in the census before, but also maybe some areas that have taken part um, but would like a refresher or uh, would like some more information um, about how to take part this September. So we've got a lot to cover, um, but we want to make sure, of course, uh, it's not just us talking. We really want to hear from you. We wanna, really want to have some discussions and hear your questions as well. So we're going to make sure we've got a lot of space for that as we go along. So I'm going to kick off um, firstly just talking about why local authorities um, should take part in the Women's Census. Uh, what, what's in it for you, really? How can it help you in your area? Talk a bit briefly about how the census works and also the learnings from uh, the 2022 census, which took place just in London uh, and also last year's census, which went um, national. And then I'm going to hand over to Ellie, who's going to be uh, talking to you about how to take part oh, this year no. and how to start. <laughs> no. Oh, um, someone's having a, an issue. Um, then I'm going to hand over to Ellie, who's going to be talking to you about how to take part in this year. So how you can start from this point onwards, really, to plan the census in your area. Um, after that fourth section, we're going to um, we're going to stop and pause and allow some time for questions and discussion around any of the kind of areas that we've covered so far. We're then going to move on to talk about the resources that you'll need, then about how to conduct the census survey, how to organise and host the data meetings. And again, at that point, we'll have another chance for group discussion uh, and any questions that you might have uh, as well. Then Ellie's going to be covering considerations for rural areas. So we've recently been doing some consultations with rural areas that took part last year to make sure that, um, yeah, the kind of guidance that we're going to be uh, sending around is applicable and useful for all kinds of locations. Um, and then finishing off with uh, who might be missing from your data. So thinking about within this very vulnerable group of women, even more kind of vulnerable and marginalised communities, which we might not be reaching necessarily, and finishing up with some top tips. And then again, at the end, we'll have more time for questions and discussion. Um, that's not to say, though, if at any point you do have a question kind of pop into your mind as we're talking, um, please just do put it in the chat and um, Ellie and I can answer it as we're going along or we can kind of come to it uh, when we do. OK, brilliant. I hope that sounds all right. And let's get going and welcome to anyone just joined us. So first of all, starting with why should local authorities take part in the Women's Census? And I'm sure some of you on this call will have a very good idea of why that is already, and that's why you're here. But just to give a little bit of background information about, about kind of why this came about. So we know that women who experience homelessness, uh, experiencing rough sleeping, um, also experience very, very high levels of violence and abuse and we know that from speaking to women themselves we know that from multiple research reports and we also know that from services that work with these women so because of that prevalence of violence and abuse we know that when women experience rough sleeping when they have nowhere safe to go at night they tend to really hide themselves away so often instead of bedding down um, in a sleeping bag on the street as we might kind of expect someone rough sleeping to do um, they'll find very very hidden places or constantly keep moving uh, and kind of use lots of different forms of rough sleeping and um, to try and keep themselves safe and out of harm's way that's really problematic um, in, in two ways, really, because first of all, that means that women are often hidden from the outreach services that go out to try and find people who are rough sleeping. 
And secondly, it means that women are very often hidden from statistics. So we're going to be talking a lot about that today. Obviously, this, this project, the Women's Rough Sleeping Census, is about gathering um, more accurate and more inclusive data. Um, and certainly the data that we see around rough sleeping um, has, has kind of shown itself to be um, very unrepresentative of women um, when we compare it to the data that we see in the Women's Census. Obviously, women not showing up in data at uh, local authority level, at a central government level is problematic because it means that um, women are then often really look, overlooked when it comes to funding for homelessness services and uh, the design and the commissioning of homelessness services. You know, if we think that the majority of rough sleepers are men, it doesn't follow that we're going to have um, many specialist services that can meet women's needs um, particularly. That lack of specialist services and lack of specialist accommodation means that women don't have options uh, that they feel safe to use. And that really kind of perpetuates this cycle of women being um, left outside of support oftentimes. So just to remind ourselves of, I suppose, um, the, the kind of original definition of what rough sleeping looks like um, as it was defined by the government in 2010 for the purpose of the rough sleeping snapshot counts. I'll leave it to you to, to have a look at the definition there, but as you can see, it's really about people sleeping or about to sleep in their bedding um, in the open air, so places that we might expect, so the streets and tents, doorways, parks, those kind of traditional places where we might expect uh, to come across people who are sleeping rough. And there's a real emphasis on this um, um, kind of presentation of bedding down or about to bed down, and this is how outreach teams determine who they think people uh, are who are rough sleeping, they know how to approach. And this is also how local authorities conduct their snapshot counts. It's people that they see according to this definition who they would then um, yeah, add to, add to their numbers and uh, kind of verify as rough sleeping. So that works really well for uh, many people who experience rough sleeping, but it does not work very well for women. And I'm just gonna um, pause now to play a really short film um, of some of the um, experiences of the women who took part in the two, 2023 rough sleeping census talking about what rough sleeping means to them what rough sleeping looks like for them uh, and how they experience it and just kind of considering how these experiences often differ from from that definition that we've just looked at so i'll just play this now
So yes, yeah, some really clear um, examples there from the women that participated in the, in the census last year about how they're rough sleeping, where they're rough sleeping, um, and resorting to absolutely desperate measures to try and keep themselves safe, um, not feeling safe in the accommodation they are. So lots and lots of kind of reasons that we're here and that we need to be doing this work. So a bit more detail on why local authorities um, should take part. So first of all, um, that point around um, just trying to build a more accurate and inclusive data set when it comes to looking at who is rough sleeping in your area. So um, government data from local authorities has always said that women represent around 15% of those rough sleeping, so a, a really kind of low uh, proportion. Um, and from the census work, we've been able to see that actually that's not the case. As all of those women just described, it's just that they're not bedding down visibly. Their rough sleeping looks different, is different. Um, so they are not being seen and they're not being kind of included in those data sets. And of course, how can local authorities tackle a problem if it's not visible, if it's not tangible, um, if there's kind of not an um, kind of accurate understanding of, of what that problem really looks like? So that's the first point, really, um, getting better data and then hopefully using that data uh, to, to get the services that you need. A really obvious point, but reaching hidden and marginalised women, you know, everyone who sleeps rough is incredibly vulnerable, um, but within that, women are even more so vulnerable for, for all the reasons that we know. Um, and I think it's really striking that almost half, I think around half of those 18, 815 women uh, who took part last year weren't currently in with a homelessness service, so they might have been met by a health service or a substance use service. Um, so really, really important that we are reaching out and finding those women who are the most hidden and the most vulnerable. And finally, kind of touching on that point around the fact that women might pop up um, elsewhere in our system. So maybe in health services, maybe in substance use services, maybe in kind of day centres or community services. Um, this is a real opportunity for participating local authorities to um, improve their partnership response to resolving women's rough sleeping, but also their experiences of other forms of disadvantage. And where we see um, the census has worked, you know, incredibly well is where that partnership response is really coming to the fore. So um, services getting together to do joint gender informed shifts, services learning from each other, services bringing their data sets together um, to really understand um, better um, the, the kind of vulnerability of women in their communities and provide that no wrong door response. So lots of really good reasons why local authorities um, benefit from taking part in the census. I won't go all through um, these in any, any kind of detail, but you can see for yourselves here, um, participating authorities from last year have fed back um, a number of kind of positive changes that they've been able to make as a result of taking part in the census. Um, there's lots of kind of changes that, that local authorities have made. Some of those are around practice change. Some of those are around um, kind of homelessness strategies and policies. Um, but here are some kind of really kind of tangible examples of how having that more accurate data has enabled areas to make the case for, for funding for women specific roles, women specific accommodation, uh, women, women specific services. So yeah, some really lovely examples there of what um, local authorities have been able to, to do with this data. So how does the census actually work? So it's two part. Uh, the first part is a census survey, um, and that's a really kind of short 10 question survey. And um, we'll think about that in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, and this this happens over a seven day period. So first of all, we ask outreach teams uh, to go out on gender informed shifts. And by that, we mean um, outreach shifts which are based around kind of women's experiences of where they're likely to be. Um, and we provide guidance about how to do that. And we ask outreach teams to go out over the seven day period um, and, and do the survey with women they encounter that have got a recent experience of rough sleeping. Over that same seven day period, we also ask other services to conduct the survey with women they support. And again, that might be any service from any sector. Uh, it might be a GP surgery. It might be a substance use uh, service. It might be a day centre. It might be a migrant service. Um, any building based service where women experiencing rough sleeping are attending, they can take part and they can ask the women that present there over that week if they would like to do the survey with them. 
We also suggested last year, and I think it worked well in some places, that services can come together in some local authorities um, to host some kind of census sessions to bring women in and get them along, obviously do the survey, but also use that opportunity to really kind of link women in with um, the support that they need. So kind of using the census as a way to maybe engage women that haven't kind of come into contact with services before. So that takes place over a seven day period. This year that starts from Monday the 23rd of September and runs till the Sunday. And then after that seven day period, um, each local authority is asked to do a data meeting and that takes place um, at some point over the month of October. And at that meeting, we ask local services. So again, all of those kind of different cross sector services, your homeless services, your Borg services, your health services, um, any others to come together and bring data sets of women that they know to be rough sleeping uh, that they've engaged with in the last three months. And Ellie will talk through how that process works. Um, and obviously there's kind of things in place to make sure that data is not duplicated. But at the end of each meeting, um, each local authority come up with a, a, you know, as a representative as possible example of how many women they know to be rough sleeping in their area. And there's also a chance for those services to talk together uh, about local challenges and, and start to think together about local um, solutions and responses and kind of things which might help. So those are kind of the two key parts of how the census works. So just to talk a little bit now about this methodology and how it kind of really gets around the problem of um, counting women or, or finding women or approaching women who are so often um, very, very hidden. And obviously the, the normal rough sleeping snapshot um, tends to often miss. So to respond to this challenge that we know that women are just less likely to bed down on the streets um, because of this risk of violence, um, we created guidance for local authorities, for outreach teams and services to, to go to and look in the places that women tell us that they shelter and rough sleep. So instead of doing a traditional outreach shift and kind of going around, scanning the streets, looking for visible people rough sleeping, uh, we asked services and outreach teams to go into stations, into places like McDonald's, into a &E waiting rooms, into toilets, all of the places where women tell us they're much more likely to be and look for them there. To respond to the challenge that we know that women are even less visible to outreach teams at night, um, just because night is obviously an even more dangerous time for women, it's dark, there's less members of the public around them more likely to be attacked. Um, and women tell us that they often then walk all night, so kind of don't, don't sleep at night at all, or they might be um, sex working in flats or hotels, so there's no way that outreach teams could ever get to them. Or maybe they'll kind of, you know, accept a, an offer of a roof over their heads with some kind of high risk stranger in exchange for something else, which again means outreach teams just wouldn't see them. To respond to that, we advise outreach teams to conduct day shifts as well as um, evening and night shifts in order to be in and around services um, and reach women that just would, would never be visible to services at night. It just wouldn't be safe enough to go into any of those environments to, to see them. To respond to the challenge um, of knowing that women's patterns of rough sleeping tend to be more transient and intermittent. So women are telling us that they, you know, if they find themselves street homeless, they're very unlikely to go to one street and sleep there every night in the same location. Um, obviously, that's how we generally base our um, outreach practice around finding and verifying people. To respond to that challenge, we widen that um, data collection window. So instead of doing a snapshot, um, as the kind of normal rough sleeping snapshot is um, over a few hours in one night, we widen that window to a period of seven days. And we also ask women about their experiences of rough sleeping over the last three months. So um, some of the women that we speak to have rough slept the night before, some of them have rough slept in the last week, and some of them might have rough slept intermittently over the last three months period. It's kind of different for every woman. Uh, it's really useful to be able to ask those questions to understand those patterns and that transience, which so often leads them to not be kind of identified at all. Because we know, as I said, that women are often known to services, so they might be linked in with a health service or a VORG service, or they might be uh, going to a substance use service for treatment, but they're not necessarily known to a homelessness service and that data isn't necessarily being shared. Um, the census includes all services and all sectors who support or encounter women experiencing rough sleeping because uh, we recognise that, you know, this, this is not an issue which can be resolved by the homelessness sector alone. Um, we need to be working together and we certainly need to be addressing that kind of intersection of disadvantage um, when we're responding to, to women that we come across. And to respond to the kind of the ultimate challenge that 
really rough sleeping provision has been designed mostly for how men experience rough sleeping. That definition is very much around how men experiencing rough sleeping. So is a lot of kind of accommodation um, and how services have worked. We haven't just gone out and tried to kind of get a number for how many women are each area. Um, as I said, we use a survey. Uh, we ask each woman that we're, is encountered questions so we can better understand what their circumstances really are. Um, and because of that, we now have a huge body of data from over 800 women um, from across England who are telling us how, when and where they rough sleep. And that's incredibly useful because they're telling us exactly what, what we need to be doing, really. Oh, so we can both we can go both move this. I won't read this out again, but just have a little look for yourselves. So um, at the start of, uh, of this uh, workshop, we looked at the government definition of rough sleeping. So that bedded down or about to bed down in certain locations. Um, and this is the gender informed definition of rough sleeping that we use for the census. So we're trying to go out and speak to and meet and find women who are experiencing rough sleeping that looks like this. So having nowhere safe to stay at all. That might be sleeping outside, sitting or sleeping in 24 hour places, walking all night, um, using other people's accommodation. They might not do it every night. It might be interspersed with other forms of dangerous hidden homelessness, et cetera, et cetera. So we used all of the kind of the data from uh, what women were told us in the first census and also um, a lot of li lived experience consultation to kind of arrive at this definition of what we're really talking about uh, when we talk about women's rough sleeping. So women in this position is who we are aiming to, to see and to speak to. In terms of the survey questions, um, we can kind of um, talk about this in more detail and, and kind of send them out in more detail. But as I said, it's it's a very short survey. It's completely anonymised. It's aimed to be very non-intrusive. Um, we've thought a lot with researchers over the years because there's obviously a million questions we'd, we'd like to be able to ask women about their support needs and their circumstances. But obviously, a lot of these interactions are very short. Um, we do not want to be re-traumatising women in any way. So we do just keep the questions to a few um, uh, things around their kind of age, ethnicity, and then um, very specifically keep it to uh, their recent experience of rough sleeping. Um, but even with these very simple questions, we are able to, to, to learn a lot um, about women's rough sleeping. And yeah, what, what's kind of come out of that has been incredibly useful um, uh, for us to see as a sector. All questions are multiple choice with a free text option um, and there's an online survey. So some outreach workers find it easier to go out with a, or some services find it easier to kind of have a, a link and complete this with a woman on a smartphone or a tablet or something. But also if services prefer a paper based version, it's absolutely fine to, to go and do that with a woman uh, in a service or on outreach and then go back to the office and, and fill the online form in as well. So. It's really quick, really easy, it takes about, I don't know, five, 10 minutes to do with a woman, depending on how much she wants to talk about. So very briefly, just to cover what we've learned so far from doing the census twice before. Um, as I mentioned, the 2022 census took place in London. Uh, that was the pilot year. I think about 25 local authorities were able to take part. Um, but even so, we were able to learn a lot um, from, from trying this out. So, as I said, we had multiple accounts um, from women over the last two years talking about or recognised, as you can see there, a quote from a woman saying, for three and a half years, I slept in woods on buses and hospitals and I was always having to hide. So, again, really, really reinforcing that idea that women are just not coming to the attention of services early enough and having to endure months, if not years, of extremely kind of um, dangerous and traumatic uh, rough sleeping. We also heard a lot from services from the pilot year that um, whilst they really enjoyed and kind of valued taking part in the census, doing so made them realise actually that they really needed to adapt their practice all year round in order to reach women. So as one outreach team manager said there, we had to make such a concerted effort to change practice to reach women during the census week. Um, doing that? Are you doing that? I'm no, not, I'm not meeting the needs of women all year round. So again, um, useful to know that, useful to kind of capture that uh, and start to work with areas to see about how they can adapt practices all year round to, to be reaching women, not just for that seven days. Ultimately, all of the data um, from the 2022 census was uh, written into a report by researchers called Making Women Count. And what that report found was, as many of us here know, um, women's rough sleeping is often hidden, transient and intermittent, which is what we thought to be the case, but this kind of confirmed it through, through data. 
And that report also told us that the current systems and processes used by local authorities and central government for establishing rough sleeping amongst women are not fit for purpose as they're designed for how men rough sleep. So again, we kind of knew that anecdotally, but um, having this kind of big data set from across London really confirmed that. Moving on to what we learned last year, the 2023 census, which was fantastic because um, 14 local authorities outside, outside London were able to take part. Um, and as you can see, quite a nice spread of different areas from across England. Um, you can see the, the names of the local authorities that took place, that, that took part there. Um, and we had more London local authorities take place last year as well. So we're hoping um, in 2024 we can get it to kind of all of the London and obviously to some more national authorities as well, which is why uh, many of you are here. What did the data tell us? Well, it was quite um, alarming what it told us, actually. Um, we don't have time today to kind of look into all of it in any depth. But as you can see, um, the 41 local authorities that took part in the women's census um, identified 815 women, and that's just through the survey. Um, many more were identified actually using the data meetings. And if we compare that to the, the normal rough sleeping snapshot count that took place in 2023, you can see that only 568 women were identified across the whole of England. So that's, you know, over 300 local authorities. So you can see a real disparity between what using a gender informed approach is able to, to identify in terms of women's rough sleeping and what kind of normal practice identifies. And just some really kind of stark figures there. So Coventry saw one in the normal snapshot count and managed to identify 61 women uh, during the census. Um, Manchester really stands out. So Greater Manchester Authority um, identified five women in the snapshot count. Uh, and then 188 women when they took part in the women's census. So huge numbers of women who just weren't being seen in data before. Um, so I think, yeah, those those figures kind of speak for themselves. This is very small and I can hardly see it, but I think what this is. Oh, yeah. So what this is showing us is, again, that comparison between um, in green, we've got um, women identified using the normal rough sleeping snapshot count. So you can see kind of the lowest bars there in the different local authorities. In orange, we can see the Women's Rough Sleeping Census survey numbers. And then in blue, we've got the women identified um, via the data meetings, because what we recognise is even over a seven day period, even kind of using this gender informed approach to outreach, we're never going to see every woman experiencing hidden rough sleeping in each local authority. And that's why we have the kind of the safety net of the data meeting as well to ensure we're being as thorough as possible to identify um, all of those women that services know are out there, but may have been completely hidden over that seven day period. But again, as you can see, um, kind of huge disparities between what services were able to identify using the, the women's census methodology um, and how things are done normally. So really kind of highlighting the need to, to be doing this and to be getting that more accurate data and just reaching those women as well. Just a few emerging themes. There's lots we could say about what we learnt. Um, but first of all, um, what the report found, bringing together all this data from across England, uh, was that current identification and verification methods um, exclude many women who sleep rough. So again, we know that's likely to be the case, but this again really confirmed it. Um, it means that the ways that women rough sleep, so hidden, transient and intermittent, um, frequently fall outside that government definition and it means they're very likely to be missed in snapshot counts and very likely to be missed in normal outreach work as well. So um, less likely to get the support and accommodation that they need. Another um, emerging theme from, from that report was that the accommodation options that women are being offered to resolve their homelessness are not necessarily doing so. So um, a third of women reported that they had actually been in some form of homeless accommodation prior to this most recent episode of rough sleeping. So that might have been a hostel, that might have been temporary accommodation. And as it says there, that's really concerning because it means that for whatever reason, women aren't able uh, or willing to sustain um, the options that they've been given. Maybe they don't feel safe, maybe they are being evicted, whatever it might be. Um, but kind of it really speaks to this kind of perpetuating cycle of homelessness that we know women do experience over years without their homelessness being ultimately resolved. So, again, really important learning um, from from that data. OK, so I'm now going to hand over to Ellie, um, who's going to start to bring all of that learning together um, and talk about how you can take part in the census um, in 2024 in your area. So thank you, Ellie. 
Thanks, Lucy. Um, yeah, before we go on to talk in more detail about kind of what it involves and how to plan it, um, I just wanted to say before questions um, that each area who's new to the census or who's taking part, um, how it works is that each area will take charge of the census for their own area, whether that's um, a local authority, a county um, or a combined authority, however your area works. Um, and you'll need to take through take on the responsibility of organising some of the different bits, getting the resources together, um, which we'll go through shortly. Um, but we can support with kind of um, providing the template resources and everything like that. If you're here from London, um, we'll go, when we go through, we'll talk about the bits that won't apply to you and the bits that will, because uh, there's a central team taking care of things um, more centrally in London for all the resources and everything like that. Likewise, in a place like Greater Manchester, that's how Greater Manchester is operating. So we'll talk through kind of what you need to do um, to take part, what it might involve if you're not kind of sure if you're taking part or not, um, and if, especially if it's new for your area. But before we go into all of that, does anyone have any questions from the first part that Lucy's just run over? Neil. So, yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, so, so Neil Freddy from uh, uh, Oxfordshire Homeless Movement. We're looking to take part in the census for the first time. Uh, this year, I'm sorry I can't get my camera on. By the way, I don't know why it's, but uh, it's it's not much of a loss. Um, yeah, so so um, my, my my question is around uh, sending outreach people into hospitals, or you, you mentioned McDonald's as well. How do how do you go about you working with the hospital on that? Do you get permission? Have you had any issues? Um, can, can, can you talk a little, a little bit about that when you're going on to you know, either retail premises or somewhere like a hospital? How do you how do you manage that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh. Do you want to go, please? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't mind. Yeah, so, well, two, two things um, to consider there. So, firstly, um, using our kind of approach to getting services, doing the, 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 the survey with women themselves, um, as much as possible, we try to engage with the hospitals around... Um, seeing if they could do the survey with women who were sleeping or sheltering in A&Es, etc. Um, we know that a, a significant proportion of women, I can't remember, I think it was about 20% of women uh, said that they'd slept that way or sheltered that way um, last year. Um, so yeah, we'd, we'd be looking to make partnerships with health teams um, and ask if um, they could actually conduct the survey over that week themselves. What we know about those kind of um, locations such as Amy's, obviously they're extremely busy, so offering where possible volunteers to do that. Um, so that's trying to get, yeah, they, those kind of services actually taking part themselves and obviously being aware of it. In terms of outreach shifts, um, having been on quite a lot it's it's always been fine just to kind of respectfully pop in to an A, de in a department or to a McDonald's late at night and um, obviously having clear ID, obviously making staff aware of what you're doing. And yeah. as, as far as I've encountered, there's never been a problem. And they're actually really happy if there is someone there in that situation to to have a, a, a person to direct them to to talk to. So, yeah, kind of two two ways to approach it, I'd say, but as much as possible, kind of bringing them in and engaging them to take part themselves. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'd also just add to that that um, yeah, obviously the hospitals are, and health centres are a bit of a, a bit different because we can engage with them prior. And um, but all of it, I think, is about building up those partnerships, especially where if you can. And lots of our machines will already do this, but make themselves familiar to people who work in the McDonald's or in the train station, th things like that, so that you've got the relationship beforehand. But also, if it's just a case of doing it during census week, building up that relationship so actually they may know how to contact you if they see someone they're concerned about in the future, um, or just having that good relationship so that you can go in in the future and they'll know, kind of, they'll be looking out for people who can point you in that direction. I think a lot of team outreach teams already do that in some places as well. Right, thanks. Thanks, Neil. Anyone else um, have any questions? Sorry, Lucy. That's all right. None for now. Uh, you're welcome to put the question in the chat or raise your hand or just shout out. But um, if not, we can move on. Great. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we wanted to go into more detail about how to take part this year. Um, I think most people here haven't done the census before. Um, but if you have, it might still be a really useful overview of kind of what the different things that you, you could be thinking about. 
Um, firstly, kind of who should lead on the census in your area? As I mentioned, um, the census, we've got a central census team, um, Lucy and myself and a couple of others um, who can support you um, in terms of resources and templates and so on. Um, but if you're, for example, um, delivering in Sheffield or somewhere, um, then you'll be responsible for um, the census in and across Sheffield. Um, and that will mean that you'll be uh, needing to collect the data yourself um, and so on. In London and Manchester, if you're kind of in a combined authority area and you're a borough within that combined authority, you won't need to do um, as much. What your role will be more about will be will be more about kind of making sure you've got all the local authorities and um, local services in your local authority involved, reaching out to services and having planning meetings with them, for example, to plan your outreach sessions or anything else that you might want to do during census week, organising your data meeting and collecting the data from that. Um, but your data will go to a more central place within the combined authority rather than you having to sort that out individually. Um, so it does depend on what type of area you're coming from today. Um, but to say that the census can be led by any organisation um, in an area, um, as long as you kind of work with women who are experiencing homelessness and rough sleeping, we find that lots of different teams can have completely different perspectives and contacts and um, that can be really helpful. So there's no prescriptive way to kind of lead and organise the census. It also doesn't have to be led by the local authority. Um, we do find obviously securing, securing um, buy-in and support from them can be really helpful, at least letting them know what's happening. That can be really valuable for sharing information, getting the most impact from the results afterwards and getting their support with it as well. Um, Lucy went through kind of a lot of the background for the census and kind of reasons why it's a yeah. <laughs> and how it can be helpful for your area. Um, a lot of you might, um, you know, you're, you're already here, so you kind of might be really convinced already. Um, but please use that information in the existing reports to help get your local authorities or other people on board with the census if you need to. You can send these slides around um, and so on, but it might just help to kind of explain to them that background if you're having difficulty getting their buy-in. Um, other services might be your local women's service, a drug and alcohol service, health teams. Uh, we found health teams to be really proactively involved, which is great. Of course, outreach teams. Um, your rough sleeping leads or commissioners or coordinators. You might be participating from, um, you might be organising it from kind of a whole partnership board. And um, we found that before where there's lots of different organisations who can take responsibility for different elements. Um, or you might just have a couple of organisations who want to do it, who come together to arrange it. And um, that's sort of how we do it in London. Um, and as I say, a combined authority uh, team will likely take a central role um, with all the organisation and so on, with each borough or district taking responsibility for their particular area and making sure the census is delivered as well as possible within that area. Um, so as I said, you'll need to take kind of responsibility for getting local services on board and planning and adapting the resources that you'll need. Um, actually, I'll talk about that next. Um, but how to get started we really encourage you to have a planning group together um some of you might have already done that which is great um and when you get that group together you can just say check with the group is there anyone else that we want on this group that could be really representative of one particular sector or something like that and that group can start to make initial decisions and plans that initial decision might be do we want to do the census do we have enough resources and capacity to do the census who can help us to do that do we need to get authority from anyone like the local authority to be able to proceed and then start making the plans um and that will likely be at the beginning to reach as wide a range of services as possible that can take quite some engagement and communications work some services will be really easy to get on board some you might realize that you have less connection with you might want to try and see who's got the most um, existing relationships with and who can reach out to them to get them on board um, and having a few representatives from those different sectors can really help from the start and I'd say really don't be discouraged if not everyone's on board. Um, the census has started off as really small in a few places. And um, we've had it where drug and alcohol teams have led the census in their area because um, because they've not seen it, the um, lead from the rough sleeping teams and they've really noticed this to be an issue and want to push forward on it. Um, and then actually having done it a couple of years that way, they've seen the kind of really a real growth in kind of um, involvement from those other teams as well so even on a small scale it can be really impactful and start to bring attention to this issue um, as well in your in your locality you might also be able to include women with lived experience in your planning group as well which can be really helpful for for that um, representation for their insights and also how they might be able to get involved in the census week itself
Um, yeah, so that's kind of what we think, what, what we suggest people start with in terms of the planning. It's really about making sure you've got enough people on board to help you with delivering it. Um, it can be quite a, a big undertaking, but it's it, it can be lessened a lot further if you've got different organisations who are really enthusiastic and can take on different pieces. Um, I'd also say um, let us know um, through the Women's Census inbox and um, the address is just up there. We can put it in the chat as well. Um, but that will mean that we can give you some support and advice um, as you're taking part. We can share with you all the updated resources. The resources will change slightly from year to year and we've got guidance and so on. Um, we can offer to come and speak to team meetings and things just to help your planning group and so on. Um, so we can give you a lot of support and, and the resources that you'll need. For example, the survey for each year um, also means that we'll be able to work with you to put your results into the national report that we'll take, uh, that we'll that we aim to deliver every year, we'll be delivering a national report this year as well. And that means your results can be represented and your views and everything like that. We'll also put on some peer support sessions for areas who told us that they want to take part so that different, you can meet different um, areas who are um, and representatives who are conducting the census elsewhere. Um, and we'll also have emails that we'll send around and we can involve you in kind of reflections after the census as well. So there's a lot that we can hopefully do to provide information, resources and support. So please do let us know either if you're interested or you're confirmed that you're taking part. And that's how I've had quite a few conversations with um, many of you already. Um, so what might you want to cover when you're planning? Um, I should say that we've written up guidance for organisers within all of this. Um, for all of this that covers a lot of this in more detail so please do read that and we're just covering kind of the basics today um but we'll have a lot more information on that in the guidance to help you think through what what you need to think about and so on but just briefly um <clears throat> it's good to think about which services can take part in the census um the wider the range of services, the better. That can take time and it might take kind of a few iterations of the census to kind of build it um, and build more and more services um but it's really helpful to do that so that we're reaching, as Lucy said, more than the homelessness sector and lots of different sectors that might be encountering women. Um, so once you know kind of which services you'd like to take part in, which sectors you want to engage, how will you engage those? Can you split that between you as a group? Can you offer open information sessions, a bit like this one where local teams can come along? Can you go out and join um, networks and forums to give some presentations? Can you go to team meetings of particular teams you really want to get involved? Um, can you set up, can you email different groups that exist and different networks and forums to get the message out there that it's happening? This is how you can take part, get in touch with us for more information and so on. And then, of course, you'll need to think about sharing information and resources, which might be a bit of a um, more straightforward one, depending on what um, how you want to deliver that and how many services you've got. You might just be able to email around all the resources to services you know are taking part. You might want to set up a web page so that people can access the resources for your area locally and can just see all the updated bits and pieces. You'll also probably want to think about lived experience, which some of you might have done already. How can you involve women in the planning and delivering and census? Talk a little bit more about what that might include, um, but so that you can get insights in actually where are the places that you might want to go for gender informed outreach, what times are best and so on in your area. Thinking about what resources you need, that's a really important one to come quite early on. Do you have what you need? I'll talk through kind of what it is that we suggest that everyone has in place for resources. Do you have the people who can help you adapt them or review the documents that need changing for your area? And can you get, have you got the right people on board who can help you with that? That might involve kind of data protection officers. Um, if they're not involved, can you get them on board? Even if it's just to review some documents and check they're happy. And you might want to deliver your own training session. Um, next week, we've got two training sessions um, for one for outreach teams and one for teams who don't deliver outreach, but will be taking part in the census. Um, we'll record those and put them online um, and they should be relevant for everyone. But of course, they won't have the specificities for your teams that might be like who to contact, how you're going to do it in your area. So if you want to do that with your um, teams, you might want to deliver specific training or like a planning workshop session. We know that a lot, lot of kind of London boroughs have done that, got together their, their local services and said, OK, what's everyone going to do? How can who can take on this bit? Which outreach team can cover this section as well? And that can be really valuable. So I suppose the first bit of planning is just working out how you're going to do all that, how you're going to reach people and engage them. 
In terms of the services to involve, we suggest, as we said, a really wide range. Certainly women's organisations, that might be domestic abuse services, it might be sexual violence support services. You might have women specialist homelessness teams or women specialist multiple disadvantaged teams and so on. And they can all be really helpful in terms of reaching a different cohort of women. Um, it's really important with those teams and others who might not be as involved, involved as much in the day to day kind of homeless um, homelessness and rough sleeping work. Make sure that you're really clear to them why it's important for them to get involved and how it's relevant to them, particularly focusing on the gender informed definition of rough sleeping that we're using. Might be drug and alcohol support services, as we've said, health teams can be really proactive and actually can really understand how important this is, particularly if they're seeing a lot of people who are rough sleeping coming through their hospital discharge team any departments because they don't have anywhere else to go and their, their health isn't improving as it should do um, so there can be real engagement positive engagement from from the health sector and um, but they might be a bit more stretched you might have to think about different ways you could offer them support to get involved immigration advice and support services are um, really really helpful community voluntary services there might be all sorts that you can reach through um, the community voluntary sector and mailing lists that they've got Food banks and soup kitchens can be really good. They're often less involved in formal data collection, um, but can have a lot of insights and information and meet a lot of people. Um, housing departments and teams and, so, and housing offices and so on, they can also get involved and that can be really um, insightful too. And of course, homelessness support services and outreach teams as well. But just think really broadly about who you've got in your area that you can get involved. In terms of involving women with lived experience, um, Things that you could ask them it can be really helpful to ask them actually what areas should we concentrate on in our gender informed shifts? What times do you think we're actually likely to get more success with going out to see women for our shifts? What services do they think should be involved? Who do they have really good contact with? One that can be really helpful is in planning. We've got training, a little bit of training on how outreach teams can sensitively support and approach women, but um, Women who've got lived experience of working with those services can have really good insights into what they'd like to hear and how it can feel comfortable for them. And also what doesn't work, what they suggest people don't do. Um, and also what support would they want to be offered? This can be, the census can be a really opp good opportunity to start those relationships with people um, if they've never been met before. And a good way to start that is kind of what do you need right now and anticipate those needs. When we did this work with women um, that experienced it in London, they said that it's really hard to know where to go and where to get support. And we also recognise that women might not want to talk to you straight away. So we um, create a template services list so that anyone can, when they've introduced for the census and done the survey, whether they take part in the survey or not, they can get an information sheet so that they can act upon, upon it and reach out for help if they want to at a later date. Um, and then different ways that you can involve women with the experience. I'm sure a lot of you will have done these um, already for this work or other work, um, but workshop sessions or consultation sessions that they can give you their insights into that planning. They might want to contribute to training either by suggesting topics, um, suggesting kind of advice that they'd give, or maybe, maybe they want to deliver some of it and be on that training session with you. Um, they might want to help you plan any census sessions that you're going to have in your area, like wellbeing sessions. Um, and they might want to be involved in delivering the census. Can they be volunteers on shifts? Can they be peer researchers who can ask the survey questions as well? So there's lots of different ways that that can um, that can take place as well. And just finally, for this section, what resources um, might you need? Um, so we suggest offering five pound vouchers for people who take part in the census survey. If you're going to have a really large area to cover and you're not going to be able to get as many vouchers as you'd like, what you can do is offer them to outreach teams as a bit of incentive for people they're just walking up to um, having never met before. Um, or you could be able to offer it to everyone who does the survey, for example, at the census sessions or just coming up to a service anyway. Um, but we people have reported that that can be really helpful for getting women on board with doing the census, partly because women can often be very hesitant about talking to services and an incentive can really help um, with kind of valuing their time and showing them that we think their time is important. Care packs can be really good for outreach teams to get together, um, just simple care packs, whatever you can whatever you can have, but that might just be some water um, and some kind of snack bars, or it might be things like sanitary products or um, change of underwear or um, 
kind of leggings and tops and things um, and you might be able to get kind of local uh, businesses to support with those um, as well just so that again you've got something to offer when you reach women and it's an opportunity to provide something they might need. You'll need to think about volunteers most likely if you need volunteers to kind of support your delivery of the census whether that's going out on shift especially if you've got kind of um, a team that's mostly made up of men in your outreach team then you can get volunteers to come on your shift to, to kind of change that gender balance so it's a bit more um, gender informed when you're going out on shift or if you want to have uh, someone based in A&E or if you want someone based in a really busy day centre where they, they want to do the census but won't have time that can be a good way to involve volunteers and so you might want to think about how to source those volunteers safely um, and in a way that's manageable for you and also think about any expenses, travel expenses you might need. A really important one for resources to, is to think about the research and data analysis for your local findings. The census team overall will take all the data back if you're willing to share it to, for inclusion in the national report without any identifying information about any individuals. So we'll do that as a national report, but that can't go into lots of detail about your particular area. So you're likely want, want, going to want to do either really minimal research or more extensive research, whether that's kind of a couple of slides on how many responses you got and roughly what the responses said, or whether it's a more in-depth report that can do more in-depth data analysis. Regardless, you're going to want some kind of kind of result from the census. So you may, might need to think about who can do that or who you can get to help do that in your local area for your local findings. Yeah. You'll also need guidance and potentially training for your participating services. The central census team produces guidance and um, that can be used for outreach teams and for non outreach teams who are taking part in the census, as well as guidance for organisers. That'll be up online in the next week or so, but there's currently older versions which can still be used. Um, so that will be kind of generic guidance for everyone. You might want to, you'll definitely want to make sure you can share that so everyone's got it. You might want to add a page that's kind of specific to your area with kind of local contact details or more information about what's happening in your area. Um, or you might just want to send it as is and kind of give those updates by email. As I said, you might want to deliver training. We've got slides that you can borrow, but again, you might want to add in kind of specific things to your area as well. As mentioned, those guidance documents are provided. We also provide the other documents that you'll need. So you'll need quite a few different documents for um, your local census, and you'll likely need to adapt those for your local area. For example, the census survey, I'll talk about that a little bit more, um, a privacy notice or similar that can tell people the information about what's happening. You will certainly need to, uh, to edit that for your own area so that it provides the right information about where that data is going because you'll be collecting the data unless you're a local authority in London or Manchester. Um, you'll need the data meeting um, resources, which you, uh, the data sharing protocol, you'll need to edit slightly, but not too much. And then other bits um, of information and documents that can be really helpful for you, again, that you might need to edit. Um, but they shouldn't be too much work to do, but you will just need to make sure you've kind of ticked those off and sorted out when and how you're going to do that and how to share it. You might also want to think about kind of what you want to offer in terms of the census week itself um, and that might be um, you might want to make sure that there are women's spaces or safe spaces that outreach teams can take women to have a chat um, we found that some areas identified that they didn't have anywhere that was appropriate and private so they made sure there was somewhere every day that they could go um, you might want to think about those well-being sessions or drop-in sessions that can be really valuable um, are there any safe spaces or safe seats that you can set up as emergency bed spaces for people who are fine during the census week? Um, it's obviously we won't want that all the time, but if you can do it during the census week, it might be a really good gesture of goodwill um, and something to test and try and see if you can get um, that kind of take up as well. But that's a real extra. Not everyone might be able to do that, but it's worth considering and any extras like that that you want to put on. So that's resources and kind of how we'd think about starting to plan and go about planning. Obviously, that'll be different for every area and you'll want to do that in your own way. Um, but we'll just take a pause there for anyone to um, ask any questions or anything like that. And after this, we'll go through in a little bit of detail um, a sense of surveying the data meetings and then round up for questions at the end as well. I think I've seen a few questions in the q and I'm just loading it. Oh, um, yeah, so um, 
Neil asks, do you already have translations of the questionnaire that we can use and a list of languages available? We have a small set of languages that we've translated the survey into that will update for the new survey this year. The new survey won't change much, but it'll just need to change the date and so on. And that's a handful of languages. Last year we did Romanian, Polish, um, some Eritrean languages. Uh, yes, I think that's most of them to Green Union and, and a couple of that. We did five. Um, so they're the ones that we'll probably share again this year. I will send an email out to all the areas taking part again, like Oxfordshire and, and so on, um, or who are taking part for the first time, and ask if there's any languages that you particularly want to see. If there are enough people um, across the different areas taking part who need that language as well, and we can resource it kind of between us all, we can get those translations as well. Um, if it's really specific to your area, then we probably can't provide it centrally. Um, but that's kind of what we we have some available. You might want to look at whether you need particular ones for your area as well. Um, and then Genevieve, um, I know she can't add to the chat. Sorry about that, but please do just unmute or put your hand up or anything like that. Um, and in the meantime, Mira. Um, I was just wondering, is there like a like a leaflet or something that we can give to women? For example, when they've taken part uh, in the survey, just to explain why we're asking that. I think it's helpful to, to say it, but also maybe for yeah. something for them to take away and, I don't know, have a read later. Yeah, definitely. So that's one of the draft documents that we provide. Um, we call it a privacy notice to be safe, but actually it doesn't need to be that um, extensive. Your local data protection officers might decide what it is you want that to look like, but definitely leaflet form that we always recommend having something to give to women even if they don't take it as long as you've read it out and, and offered them the leaflet definitely yeah and we're going to do Thank some you. posters as well which we'll send out a kind of template for and then services can change it for your, obviously your local areas and then you mm -hmm. can have that up in doctor surgeries or hostels or you know where, wherever it would be good to to let women know it's happening if they'd like to take part yeah, yeah that'll be that'll be really good thank you uh genevieve Thanks, Ellie, and um, thanks very much to you as well, Lucy, for the information today. Quick question, and you're probably about to cover this actually now that I look at what's the next topic, but do you feel there needs to be availability to interview women after five o'clock? Um, so I think that really depends on your services. If your services are open, normally open after 5 p.m., I would suggest that people are able to do the survey whenever they come to the service. If you're not already delivering kind of weekend work or after hours work, um, you don't have to put anything on. If it's something you are able to do, that sounds like it really might be a nice option. You could do an evening women's session somewhere or something like that. But that's up to you and the resources that you have. Well, I'm wondering also for evenings, do you allow these questions to be asked by telephone or must they be face to face? It can be by phone, yeah. Oh, lovely. OK, great. And then about translation, there's so many free translation services online. Do you care if we translated ourselves for some specific things in our area? Do you need pr approval? You don't need approval as long as you're taking care to make sure that you're confident the translation is accurate and that the person you're speaking to fully understands what's happening, what you're asking, how they'll use your how they how you'll use their information. As long right. as they have a good understanding of that and you feel that they have a good understanding of the questions. That's up to you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thanks, Jenny. Does anyone else have any other questions? OK, great. Well, we're on to the last section here. You'll all be pleased to know. Um, and then we can hand over for any final questions as well. Um, but as I say, this is all just kind of an overview. You can find out a lot more of the detail in the guidance um, that I've sent around to most people, but we'll send around and put on the website as well in the next few days. Um, but what does conducting the survey involve? So a really key part of that is gender informed shifts for your outreach teams. Um, if you've got a commissioned receiving outreach teams, we do ask them to deliver a minimum of six hours of gender informed outreach over the census week. Depending on your area, you might want to or be able to deliver more than that uh, and go ahead. You can conduct as many hours as you like, um, but we ask for a minimum so that we know that each area has has made a concerted effort to deliver gender informed shifts. Um, you're going to want to select times and locations in which 
teams are more likely to see women in your local area. We have the guidance on the outreach goes into more detail about what we suggest those times are. Um, but we make suggestions of those times so that you are really thinking about and trying something different that might work for women. If that doesn't work for you, please do try something different. But I would really suggest making sure that your teams are trying something else. What we don't really want to see is kind of outreach teams just doing what they normally do. Um, but you might know that something, the information that you get from women in your area, for example, or your local intelligence might tell you that something really specific will work for you. Please absolutely go ahead and do that. It's about That's what it's about, reaching women in your area. You might want to do joint outreach shifts with other teams, which would be absolutely fine. Or you might agree with different teams that you'll cover different areas across the week. Um, and you can be really thinking and preparing from, from now until September, really. Where are you seeing women? Where can you add into your shift? Well, where are the hotspots and, and useful times to go out? Um, and basically, when you're on the gender informed shift, you can complete the survey with um, women. And that's during census week. Um, so you can only complete the census survey with women during the census week, but they can be on gender informed shifts or on any other shifts as well and in services. Um, you might have teams who aren't a commissioned outreach team. As we said, they can absolutely deliver gender reform shifts as well. They might already be like a women's specialist team and therefore doing specialist shifts already, in which case they can go ahead as they are. Um, or they might be teams that deliver in a similar way to the rough sleeping team, but might also want to adapt with the, these kind of more gender informed um, points and adaptations as well. So during the census week as well, um, Outreach is just one of the ways in which you can um, ask people about this and ask people to do the census survey, but you can also do it in any services, as we've said, kind of drug and alcohol services, drop in centres, um, homelessness day centres, women's services, health teams, food banks, soup kitchens, um, and you can conduct those, as Jenny pointed out, you can do, conduct those on the phone um, you might have an appointment arranged with them or someone might just drop in if you see them or talk to them during census week absolutely go ahead and do the survey with them accommodation services can also do the survey as well with their residents that might be because someone has been moved into the service recently and was sleeping in the three months before that um, or in the past three months before they moved in or you might be conscious that they're not always using their accommodation and are rough sleeping sometimes that's absolutely fine to do it with them. I suppose just be wary um, if you're the person that the accommodation service, if they'll feel a bit nervous answering those questions in case they think there'll be anything that comes back on them from that if they admit they're not using their room all the time, for example. So just reassure them about that if you can, or maybe get someone else to ask them those questions. Services can answer the survey just during their normal service provision. But as Lucy mentioned, we can find we found it's really popular for uh, last year for services to deliver like a census session that's allowed them to reach more women to encourage women to come in and use the service and um, have in reach from lots of different services at once it can be a really positive session with only part of it being about doing the census survey and the rest of it being about women's well-being and access to services as well and you might want to encourage volunteers to do that or get services together to to arrange and plan those together so that again you kind of spread spread the organizational load a bit as well and then we've got the data meetings um, we're going to record and um, upload kind of more detailed information on this. And there's more detailed information in the guidance that we have. Um, but just as an overview about what what the data meeting is, it was a new element of the census last year and we're doing it again this year. We might change the name to be a bit more friendly. Um, so watch out for that. Um, but it's the second element of the census um, and it's about representing as many women as are known to services in the census data, including those who have or haven't been seen during census week. It doesn't matter. It's just about kind of understanding how many women services are working with um, and also talking to services about what their experiences are of working with women and what they think are the main challenges in supporting women to access accommodation. Um, it's about bringing multiple services together for conversations and partnership working as well. People have found it to be really fruitful for that and just hearing those different perspectives as well. And the outreach team might have one experience of meeting women and they don't see many women potentially or they see women in very certain particular circumstances. The drug and alcohol service may see a completely different cohort of women um, and a migrant service, for example, and that can be really helpful to get everyone together and talking about those different um, experiences. You should deliver one data meeting per borough, 
For example, in combined authorities, we suggest that every local authority delivers a data meeting. If you're, for example, in Gloucestershire, you might want to just deliver one data meeting that brings all services together, or you might want to split it up um, as, as works for you in terms of different districts. Um, that's absolutely fine. Um, however, you need to deliver that what's best for your area. Um, meeting organisers can be your local census organisers or you might want to pass it on to an appointed lead within the borough. For example, someone who's got lots of connections with those services already and will be a good person to lead it and invite lead it and invite services. Um, and it's most effective when you've got as many people involved as possible. Um, and we would suggest you can organise that data meeting now. It should take place after census week, but there's no reason you can't put it in the calendar for kind of the 15th of October now. Um, as long as it's done by after the census and by the end of October, that's fine. And I won't go into much detail on this, but what you'll need to do beforehand is invite relevant local services. That's the main thing. Make sure that you've shared the guidance with them and they know what they need to prepare and bring to the session. Um, Look at the data sharing protocol so that um, you've got an updated version that they can sign and familiarise yourself with what how you'll need to lead the meeting as well. We've got a data meeting workbook, which is a bit more simple than what we had last year, but asks for the same information. So you can just familiarise yourself with that. It shouldn't take long and maybe watch our video that kind of talks through how to deliver it. And then during the meeting, what you'll do is do a bit of introduction and background. Go around each service and ask for their data, ask for the number of women who meet the criteria that the service has worked with in the past three months. Check for any duplicate clients or kind of across the services that you've got. And that's kind of the technical bit of the meeting, but that should get you a really representative number of how many people, how many women are in the borough. Then you'll want to facilitate a discussion with all the services there about what challenges they encounter when trying to support women that can be really really valuable and can really inform any next steps that you want to take after the census we found those to be really insightful and through the census survey and through the data meeting you can get um, insights from women that you meet as well as from services and, and practitioners working on the ground as well and then you might want to facilitate a brief discussion on the census week and how it went and any feedback that people have for you on that and how they found it um and then very quickly, just on rural areas, um, many of the difficulties of reaching and counting women are similar to the difficulties of reaching and counting people in rural areas. There's a lot of crossover there and that those challenges can include um, needing to deliver outreach across vast areas or difficult environments such as big forests um, or lots and lots of fields. Um, you might also have a limited outreach resource compared to the size of the area. So you might not have an outreach team that can cover the whole area, just kind of hotspots. Um, or you might have a kind of central location in which there are lots of services and then a huge area where there aren't really any services. What we would encourage you to do is think if you are one of those areas, if you're not and you can kind of deliver the census as the guidance suggests, that's great. If you're not, you might want to think about how to adapt your outreach a bit more flexibly than the guidance suggests. That might be reaching out to more services and focusing on that aspect rather than the outreach. It might be focusing on one area per day where you can deliver outreach, a census session and do the census survey as well. Um, intelligence gathering, people have told us, is really important for rural areas. That's a really key bit to do in the planning um, because that will guide you in terms of where, which areas to focus on across your vast region. Um, and then they also suggested, when we spoke to the rural areas who've done it before, they do suggest do as many of the different elements as you can. So do the census survey and do the data meeting. Even if you're worried you're not getting many census surveys, one census survey or two census surveys can still give you an entire picture of the survey from one woman. And that can give you lots of insights that the data meeting, for example, can't and vice versa. So we do encourage you to do both elements. And then I'll just pass back over to Lucy to cover a few final bits briefly and then we'll close for any questions and so on. But thank you for listening to me for such a long time. <laughs> Yeah, I just thought um, it might be actually good because there's a lot of information covered um, there already, whether I wonder if anyone had any questions about the data meetings or getting services and outreach services to take part in the survey um, or anything else that Ellie's just covered before I move on. Thanks, Charlotte. I've just seen your message. Um, I know a few people have had to leave, but yeah, we'll share the recording in the slides. Yeah, so any, any, any questions before I move on to a couple of last slides. No, perfect. Okay. Oh, Fleur, hiya.
Hi, sorry. Um, very quick question. Is there, um, so uh, Tal Hammett did it last year, but I'm going to be leading on this year for the first time. I just wanted to display, is there anything sort of significantly different in the methodology or anything like that this year that should be flagged? No, I know there's a couple of like updated forms and stuff, but it's broadly the same. Yeah, okay. exactly. Great. Yeah. Thank just you very much. some minor yeah. updates and we might change the name of the date meeting, but it's the same. <laughs> Great, thank you. I thought I'd just double check. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. Anyone else got any questions at this point about the data meeting or the survey or about rural areas? No? Okay, great. Just a few more things to share before we close. So just thinking about who might be missing from your data. Um, so obviously we have worked hard to create a methodology uh, and an approach which will reach as many women as possible and we've consulted with many women with lived experience many different services um, to get to the point that we are and um, what we need to recognize though is that even using this gender informed methodology it's likely that there will be women um, and particular groups within this very vulnerable group of women experiencing hidden rough sleeping uh, that we just might not be able to get to and we need to recognize that women's challenges um, of being seen by services and feeling comfortable to engage with with things like the census um, might be compounded by their intersectional experience. So, for example, thinking about um, the specific needs and challenges that trans women experience um, or women experiencing language barriers, uh, women who fear immigration services and will just not you know, be comfortable to speak to anyone who might be approaching them uh, in the way that we're suggesting. Um, young women, racially minoritized women, you know, we know there are so many barriers to accessing any services at all, um, fears which are very justified through their own past experiences, um, which mean they're just that much further from support and from the kind of outreach approach that we're suggesting um, than, than other women might be. So it's important that we recognize that, first of all. Um, and I think that what, what we'd advise in terms of an approach to take um, is just to consult with the specialist services in your local areas and the buy and for services in your local areas to see how kind of local adaptations can be made to ensure that women are reached as much as possible using um, both the data meeting approach and the census survey approach. Um, if that's not possible um, for a number of reasons, so we had a uh, really helpful chat with um, a specialist service for migrant women the other day who were saying that, you know, it's both because of capacity, but also because of the nature of um, asking for this information. It's just very likely that um, migrant services wouldn't be able to take part in the way that we're suggesting. Um, what we'd suggest is to think, how can these services um, take part in a different way? And how can these groups be represented in uh, the data that you're gathering? So that might take the form um, of asking for um, uh, another kind of data set just kind of given by those services it might take the form of some case studies being submitted which you can kind of put with your census data to sit alongside it to kind of illustrate the the particular needs of these more hidden groups between um and and they might have other kind of ideas uh which which we haven't even thought of yet but really important just to to recognize that um even using these kind of two ways of, of reaching hidden women so the the survey the gender informed shifts um, and also the data meetings, it's likely that we will not be reaching and kind of accounting for the experiences of all women. So um, being mindful of that, being creative about, uh, about your approaches and reaching out to those specialist services to, to ask what do they advise and also involving lived experience, um, women with lived experience in those conversations as well. Just a few top tips to end with as well. So um, to start as early as possible. So, yeah, this has been a common theme um, both years that we've delivered the census. Areas tell us that the earlier they start, um, the, the better it is really for, for getting services involved, for getting the planning done. Um, obviously, we know that summer goes really fast. I can't believe we're halfway through July already. So, you know, it won't be long before census week is upon us. So hopefully today um, will have been useful in, in kind of giving you those ideas around next steps to take. And yeah, we'll hopefully be a springboard for your area starting to, to, to get a group together, um, start the planning and start to take some action. So, yeah, we'd really advise that uh, to start as early as possible. 
just to recognise that engaging services and um, particularly services outside the kind of rough sleeping and homelessness sector who might not really identify with the name of this project, you know, the Women's Rough Sleeping Census, what's that got to do with me? And um, that can take time, you know, getting very busy, very overstretched services to do something additional. It's really understandable that that is going to, you know, take time, take conversations. Um, it might take going into their team meetings and um, talking to them about how and why they should be involved. Um, because some services might not necessarily identify that the women that they are supporting or encountering are rough sleeping in that kind of traditional sense. So again, as Ellie mentioned, really important to explain that actually we're talking about women that have nowhere safe to stay. We're not talking about women who are necessarily kind of, you know, lying in a sleeping bag on the street as as we kind of expect from that definition. But yeah, giving those services time and it's also um, absolutely fine if, if not all services in your area are willing or able to come on board. You know, for many of you here, you will be piloting the census this year um, and what we know about it um, from doing it well it'll be the third year in London um, you know engagement grows um, year on year and we hope this is something which is going to you know have the potential to, to to be replicated but also to be continued in the areas that are doing it so it's fine if not everyone can come on board straight away. Services may have capacity issues. As I said, we know how overstretched all services are, particularly services like health services. Really, really lots of willingness there. But just when it comes to the day and the week, they just they can't. They're short staffed. They need to just do their kind of um, most important jobs that week. Um, could they be involved in other way? Uh, could could you offer them volunteers to kind of go into, as I mentioned, A&Es or to kind of sit in a, a, a GP surgery, um, if you, especially if you've got a kind of homeless health GP setting, getting volunteers in there for a couple of shifts a week could be really helpful. Could they at least come to the data meeting? Because actually that seems um, much more doable to kind of just bring some data and sit in a meeting for an hour and a half rather than do the outreach. Um, could they provide case studies or lived experience? So thinking creatively about how services can be involved, even if they can't um, take part in the survey, for example. Services also may drop out. That happens a lot over, I think, both censuses that we've been involved in. Um, people have the willingness to be there and then inevitably people are off sick or can't do the shift. Um, it's fine just to do what you can with what you've got. Um, as I said, kind of having recruiting a bank of volunteers that can be kind of operationally kind of put around different services quite quickly or join shifts at uh, short notice. Ideal if you can do that. But yeah, just do what you can when it comes down to it. Um, and as it, said, it says there, just to note it in your methodology form, kind of what you've been able to achieve and when. Worrying about duplication when carrying out the census survey. Um, we've had a lot of um, research input into developing this methodology. We haven't just kind of... Um, Kind of pull these questions or the way that they're asked um, out of the air. So, what we have been kind of, I suppose, reassured um, about by all of those researchers is that um, we don't need to worry too much about duplication. Essentially, and um, the census is is not about counting every single woman who's experiencing hidden rough sleeping because we know that's not possible. Um, it's about getting a more representative figure in your area than than kind of previous methods have been able to. Um, there are mitigation factors in the in the survey itself. For example, the last question is, has anyone asked you these questions before this week? So duplicates can be re uh, removed from the data, um, but it's much more likely that women will be missed than they'll be counted twice. So it's not something to really worry about. And finally, thinking about um, what support you can offer or arrange for women or for staff during the census week. Um, because I suppose what's really exciting about the census work is it's not just about going out and getting a, a really good set of data to then use afterwards. It's about those connections, um, both with the women that you're coming across who might never have spoken to a service before. I think in both censuses, I think about 14% of women both times had just not been um, brought into support by services at all. They weren't engaging with anyone. So what an amazing opportunity to kind of start and, and take action there with those interactions. Um, also to kind of link up different services that they can then continue to work um, in partnership um, together kind of all year round. So really thinking about, um, you know, what could the next steps be if a woman is encountered that really has a lot of needs, hasn't kind of been brought into services before? Will everyone have the information? Um, could you kind of link them into a bed space straight away? Um, it's a really good time to start thinking about kind of joining things up in your area and also continuing that work after the week as well. And I think that brings us um, neatly to a close. So we've got seven minutes left of the session for any questions that you may have. Um, I appreciate that's a, a huge amount of information that we've um, 
imparted there. Uh, luckily, this is all also in written guidance, which goes into lots and lots of detail about all of those different parts. And we're also going to be doing some um, kind of bite size um, video content. So if you're like, oh, what was the data meeting again? You can just go and watch a five minute video about exactly what it is and how to do it. So hopefully all of those resources together um, will make sure both you, but also other people in your local area that might need to be leading on this um, and, and delivering this will have everything that they need.